Well, hi everybody and welcome back. Still in Portland at the annual National Geological Society of America meeting. This is what a poster session looks like. It's still kind of early morning, so it's not super slammed with people yet. But Aaron Donaghy, who you've met before in previous videos, is here, and I've asked her if she'd be willing to be on camera. So uh, I'm going to talk to her for just a little bit. But this is uh, kind of the scene. So if you're a research person, you stand by your poster, and this is one way to share your results and get discussions going. Well, third time. I mean, maybe maybe this is me <laughs> a little more comfortable each time we do this. Um, but I'm so excited. I've barely looked at your poster. Is this summarizing your work just this past summer? Yes. Okay. So, so um, those that have seen the video with you in the Chumstick, you were that was right before you headed out there. Yes. So, generally, how did it go? I thought it went very well. Okay. We were able to hit all of the locations that we wanted to find all the rocks that we were hoping to yes. and uh, collected a lot of samples and did a lot of lithophases mapping and a lot of conglomerate class counts. So, so you so. did your homework. You weren't just randomly hiking around out there. You had no. everything nailed yeah. down. What was your process back in Indiana to kind of map out where you wanted to visit when you got to the peninsula? Yeah, so I'm sure many people are familiar with how forested and yeah. densely forested the Olympic Peninsula is. Mm -hmm. So one of the main tools I actually utilize is Google Earth and satellite imagery because I can scan then on the Olympic Peninsula yeah. where I see exposed and then also talking to the logging companies that are out there. They all have roads, well-maintained road networks that cross all of these different areas we wanted to tackle. Mm -hmm. And so by talking with them, they could tell me where some of their road cuts were or their pits mm -hmm. in some of the formations that we were interested in. And so working with them was really helpful so that we were able to kind of target the exact areas we wanted to go to and use their roads and we weren't hiking around bushwhacking right. for hours and hours and hours for you know a little rinky dink <laughs> outcome. <laughs> all right so getting our bearings so there's port angeles and squim and you're not in the national park or you are so the blue mountain unit is mm -hmm. exposed in the national park so blue mountain is part of the park and okay. then we worked hurricane hill clawhane ridge and mount angeles those mm. are all part of the national park but the rest is either forest or the wilderness, like Buckhorn Wilderness area is oh, where Tyler yeah. Peak is. Okay. And, and then this, on the peripheral rock, most of this area is the uh, logging companies. And then there's a nice road that goes through here that we were able to use logging company roads that kind of spurred off of those I locations. See. So all of these rocks and the sedimentary units here that are in the brown colors are, are known as the peripheral sequence in okay. literature. Mm -hmm. And these have all been very well studied by previous researchers in the 80s and the 90s. But what's missing is the putting this into the context of Celestia's collision, mm -hmm. because that was not the original interpretation back then. Originally, the Blue Mountain unit here, which with Michael Eddy's New Ages, we found out as much younger than it was previously interpreted mm -hmm. to be, would mm -hmm. then be age equivalent to some of these younger peripheral rocks. Okay. And so our, I, our goal was to put this into context of this peripheral rock stratigraphy, and then also put this stratigraphy as a whole in the context of Celestia's collision. Because originally, Blue Mountain Unit was thought to be interfingering with the lowermost crescent, mm -hmm. and that these were continentally derived turbidites, and we had a rifted four arc setting. Mm -hmm. So what we found now is with these younger ages, yeah. well, if the Blue Mountain Unit is interfingering with these volcanics, 
Well, then that would suggest there's a much younger phase of volcanism that is not part of Celestia's construction. So what we Whoa. wanted to do this summer was test, are these sediments really interfingering with the lower crescent or is it structurally faulted? And so that was the primary goal of looking at the Blue Mountain unit this summer to try to determine that relationship because if they are interfingering, then we have this younger phase of volcanism that hasn't really been talked about or discussed uh, in previous literature in context of it would follow Celestia's collision. So it would be after. So you dock Celestia <laughs> and coming up through this newly docked Celestia is some volcanism that is, you don't have dates yet for this kind of post Celestia volcanism story no, or you we do? We collected some samples, okay. but the issue with this type of volcanism is that it's very basaltic. So we're not sure if we're going to be able to get zircon oh. out or enough zircon out, but mm -hmm. we did collect samples from some of the volcanoclastic units mm -hmm. that could help with that. But we can also use this interfingering age relationship that if the sediments are interfingering, well then those volcanics also have to be the same age uh, because they would be deposited at the same time. Got it. So. Now, that in itself is a cool story. It maybe it wasn't your initial driver, and maybe it was this kind of post Celestia volcanism, but I thought I understood that previous years you got to know the Chumstick Basin quite well and the ages, yeah. and then you were trying to find potential correlation with the Chumstick out here on the peninsula, and then ultimately going to Alaska next summer. Is that still the plan? Yeah, so kind of in the paper that we had published, still impressed with the GSA bulletin, okay. the idea was that the Chumstick Basin, which is located, I don't think I have a map to, well, sure. you know, two hours east of Seattle, yeah. Chumstick sitting all the way out here, Got it. and Chumstick formed following the collision of Celestia as an extensional pool part basin. Mm -hmm. And so... Nice talk yesterday, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. And so we also then know that we have sediments coming down onto Celestia, where Celestia accreted. Yeah. And so even though these two areas are very spatially removed from each other very far, they were being, the sediments, the Eocene sediments were being deposited at the same time. And so we were curious if we saw similar detrital zircon signatures in the Blue Mountain, which this was kind of the, the samples we were comparing to, if some of those age spectra overlapped with what we saw in the Chumstick, because possibly then if there was a regional fluvial system that drained out towards Celestia, then we could see similar peak age populations and an overlapping of where sediments were being derived. So. Exciting idea, the old <laughs> yeah. Chumstick River, I believe, in, yeah. in one of your, one <laughs> yeah. your papers or something. Yeah. So is it too early to see familiar Chumstick looking stuff in this Blue Mountain unit? Are these, these, these younger peripheral guys? So the Blue Mountain unit, there were some age overlap okay. uh, and there's also some significant differences. So you could have a setting where when the Blue Mountain unit was being der derived or deposited yeah. that you had one big continental fan. Maybe this was deriving sediments more from the east, but we also have strong evidence that there's more local sources that were supplying sediment to the Blue Mountain unit. So. Okay sources that match uh, units that are exposed on oh, Vancouver Island. Oh, we're so, getting into the terrain stuff, yeah. the older terrain stuff now, So you right? could have inner fingering of the fans yeah. and be driving sediments, sediments from two different regions. Those aren't submarine fans, are they though? They are submarine fans. Wait a minute, yeah. after Celestia is accreted? Yeah, which requires a pretty rapid subsidence falling collision of plateau. All of this, all of the peripheral rocks in the Blue Mountain unit has been or interpreted as deep marine oh. submarine fans and turbidites, which is very interesting. Yes, <laughs> I, I just so. kind of vaguely remember we kind of got into that in the spring that you, you docked this crazy thing. Mm -hmm. It definitely was above sea level during the initial docking. Shallow like, marine to subaerial. Yeah. It, it was it was either 
close or subaerially exposed. But it didn't last long as a subaerial no. addition. <laughs> Like that's, I guess uh, I'm slow on the uptake, but that's what you're showing here. So this is, this is Celestia and the stuff that's now up in Alaska. Mm -hmm. It's been docked as one unit and then everything's under sea level here. Yes, so it has to collide, it has to rapidly subside in order to make this space for these, make a basin, accommodation space for all of these sediments deep marine sediments. It's not, <laughs> your, it's not your study, I guess, but what's the thought? Like, why is this thing subsiding so quickly after it adds? Yeah, it could be thermal subsidence is likely the driver to that. Um, we also have to consider maybe where the Yellowstone hotspot was, what that was doing at the time. I hmm. kind of removed that for simplicity of this poster presentation. <laughs> good choice, good choice. <laughs> but you collide this and it was still being constructed yeah. during its co collision. Yeah. You remove that heat source and it rapidly subsides. So thermal subsidence would be the main driver in this case. And so it's interesting to then think about how fast that has to happen. And it's part of a, our larger research questions would be understanding terrain collision and docking and what what happens after. How long does it take to get a sedimentary basin that forms on mm -hmm. top of this newly accreted terrain? How, what is that basin that forms on top exactly. of that newly accreted terrain? I think those are all questions that we're trying to tackle with okay. this with this research project. So. I got two more things and then I'm, I'm <laughs> hogging your time here, so I'll let you talk to some others. So this is pretty attractive down here. Uh, can you help? Uh, what, what, is, what are you trying to convey here with these beautiful little pie charts? Yeah, so these are conglomerate class counts. So what, what happens is when we come across a conglomeratic outcrop, we'll sit there and we'll kind of make a grid and we'll count between 100 and 150 conglomerate class. Then you document the lithology and you also document the class size. And this helps us determine where sediments are coming from because we can then take those different composition lithology class and start thinking about, okay, what terrains are near me? Where could these sediments actually be derived from? And so we did it a long strike in this unit so that we could see if there was any long strike changes, which would help us reconstruct our paleo environments. So did we have one fan deriving sediments from a source or did we have multiple fans? Those changes in provenance would be able to help us constrain where our sediments were coming from. Mm -hmm. So we do it a long strike. And then we also look at the class sizes to help us try to figure out, okay, what's a proximal deposit and what's a more distal deposit? Because that helps us also think about where we might be in the submarine fan system. And overall, these conglomerates is, they're boulder to cobble breccias. Mm -hmm. They've been described as boulder breccias out here on Cape Flattery. And so that's also a really unique deposit to have on a submarine fan. Uh, you don't generally get in a deep marine setting these boulder cobble breccias. Yeah. So uh, it's likely some sort of channel fill that could have then been driven by a tectonic process. And so then we can start thinking about, okay, what was my plate tectonic setting and what would be the tectonic event that drove uplift and dumping all of these core sediments into mm -hmm. my deep marine basin. The conglomerates so, are in the Blue Mountain unit or, or, or different units now? These are the Lyre, the Lyre conglomerates. So they are... Younger than the Blue Mountain. They're younger. Okay. We, well, when we get ages, we'll be able to ah, test that. But it, we, we believe they're younger. Okay. And so the sequence we're thinking is maybe Blue Mountain is this oldest part yeah. of the peripheral rock sequence. Then yeah. you would have deposition of the Oldwell. And then those quartz green conglomerates of the Lyre. And then once you get to Hoko River all the way up, you get just classic deep marine turbidite sequences, rhythmic beds of sandstone and siltstone, wow. uh, which kind of signals we had subsidence of our basin again and just more normal deep marine turbidite uh, setting. So something's going on here that you, you dump all of this coarse grain material. And right. so I'm interpreting that to be some sort of tectonic driver with plate reorganization following the collision of Celestia. 
Well, this is, I mean, <laughs> just the look of these pie charts, this is a familiar approach, right? You did this in the chum stick. I did. With did. those cob with those cobbles <laughs> and you had a source to the north with a, a, a kind of a variable terrain source. Yes. And you're seeing that same uh, mixed lithology in these cobbles and, and you maybe don't have the variety of terrains peripheral to this or do you? I mean, there's Rangelia, it's like mm -hmm. what else could it be? Like Yeah, so you would have oh my God, all you're, of the you're trees. Photo bombing every time I turn <laughs> this thing on. I just think here, it must be good. Jeff Tepper. <laughs> oh hi Carol. Okay. Exposed on Vancouver Island, so oh, parts of Rangelia. Okay. So you were correct there. Yeah. Um, the Nanaimo group, the Leech River complex. Uh, these are all possible proximal sources for the peripheral rock sequence. The San Juan Islands as well. Oh, right. Then, There's so much variation there. <laughs> yeah. Got it. So Got it. those would be the proximal, and it's much easier to think with, especially a coarse grain deposit, while yeah. it couldn't have been transported far from its source, we would want to look for something close by. Got it. Okay. You're doing great. I got one more, <laughs> one. And, then, and then I'm sure Jeff wants to chat with you. You know Jeff Tepper, I assume. Have you met? I'm not sure. We've met in person, but I know, I know of you. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, the Alaska thing. Like when I, when I met you and Mike up at Mission Ridge last summer, I guess it was Mike, maybe you, I can't remember. And you were like, hush, hush about it, I guess. <laughs> and maybe you're still hush, hush about it, but you were finding sedimentary units on the Olympic Peninsula that had a source to the west of the Olympic Peninsula and that source is no longer there to the west. Yeah, so that's part of, that's one of the ideas, and that's kind of depicted in this figure here, is that with the wire formation, we see this overall coarsening from east to west. You have the coarsest grain deposits on Cape Flattery. Well, this is it. These are the units yeah, that are coarser are, to the west. Yes, these are a source for the, the liar conglomerate. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. They Exciting. have this trend where you see this westward thickening of the strata, as well as this transition from more sandy conglomerates to cobble boulder conglomerates and breaches out on Cape Flattery. Mm. And so one possible thought would be that you collide Celestia, you start rifting, and you're translating your Yakutat terrain to the north. Your ridge has jumped down to the south, more in Oregon, where we see some of that age volcanism and near trench plutonism. And then this ridge eventually has to go back to the north to get to its present day position. And so possibly as it's migrating to the north, then we can pop up and provide some sort of source or closer proximal source for these coarser grain deposits mm. that maybe the source is no longer here. We do have strong evidence that there is also, these sediments were also being derived from Vancouver Island, but some of those class lithologies can't be linked back to places. So maybe there were proximal places at least. So maybe there was some sort of terrain that was out there or um, source that's no longer there. But we can source these really coarse grain deposits, which we think is tectonically driven. By passing our ridge, you would pop, exhume everything up yeah. and then have really coarse grain deposits coming down from that rapid exhumation as the ridge passed by. Fascinating. <laughs> so, without giving away everything, next summer, God willing, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're up in southeast Alaska, you're yes. to the Yakutat, you've maybe already done some of your work already to like know where you'd want to go, mm -hmm. but you'd be doing this same kind of pebble count, cobble, whatever, and, and uh, and pulling out zircons where you can, or is it a whole different approach when you're going to be going up there to, yeah. to continue the story? So the main target would be the Sam Over Hills near Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Oh, you've got it already figured and out. You know where you're going. <laughs> so we would be looking at the age equivalent strata, so same age strata that were deposited on the Yakutat terrain then, and Ken Ridgeway and 
has done a lot of work up there already and there's track columns and these are non-marine, more deltaic looking deposits. So the goal would be to do detrital zircon provenance on those yeah. because if Yakutat was once adjacent to Silesia or the Pacific Northwest, yeah. if we have a really detailed sampling of sandstone so that we can do, do detrital zircon provenance, we hope to then be able to track Yakutat's northward journey by correlating the detrital zircons to sources that would be coming oh from the God, coast mountain really? bath lift as it migrated northward. So I'm not I'm not sure about if there's conglomerates, we would definitely do conglomerate class count. But it all depends on what the lithologies of the rocks are gonna be once we get up there. Well that's too big a project, isn't it? Like you you would have to then do Enough well, luckily work the on, work has been done has. <laughs> here that there's some new age data that hopefully using some new techniques, chemical abrasion before laser ablation of detrital zircons that we have been testing this semester as well, that we would be able to get precise enough peaks to trace back to distinctive sources along the coast mountain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So one more field season minimum, maybe more? I, what do you yeah. think? Like, I think it all depends on funding for Alaska as far as we will definitely do at least one. If we get more funding, we could do more than one. So. I thought Mike was loaded. <laughs> well, <All right. laughs> in the Cascades in Nevada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So. Well, thank you for yeah. your time, Aaron. It's of course. always it's always fun to chat with you. And yeah. I know this was this was uh, y'all did this from beginning to end. This poster was like the last <laughs> five days or something, like to try to draft oh. this thing up. Yeah, uh, like, I was running out of time. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so. Well, I'd say it, it's so. it's beautifully laid out. Thank you. I don't know. Do you feel like you want to ask anything on camera? You want to say I turn the camera no, off? Turn the camera off. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. You bet. You can take that off and, and hit your blue button. Wonderful. Fascinated geologists for over 100 years. Our goal is to describe a narrow time slice through the trough and to explore the linkages between it and rocks of the Cordillera.